Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, okay, so let's, we do have a bunch of stuff to talk about, so let's get started. I'll defer um, to the bar manager. Okay. Um, I will have an announcement and more things to talk about at the meeting. Um, having to do with the capital plan, but I would probably ask maybe we could skip right to the information items. Sure. I don't have a lengthy update. Okay. Right now. Well, you know what? I actually do have a question. Um, sure. I received an email from a citizen inquiring about our right to know process. Um, I shouldn't say that. Not really the process, but rather what is the cost mm -hmm. of a right to know request. Yeah. So, you know, we all agree that right to know is a fundamental right and a very important right that citizens have um, the right for records. Um, and the right for, for, for certain emails. But to do so, there is both a fiscal and an opportunity cost to the borough. Um, and someone asked for clarification for that. So, um, Sean, it's not spelled out on the budget. You, you know, it's not as nuanced where it says solicitor fees and then right to no request. So, so I, doesn't. well, for sometimes the solicitor, in fact, does have to go through emails or documents that are requested. So there is a financial cost to that. Yeah. But I wanted to explain to the citizen that this is not something that you can hand off to someone, that you are our, our right yes. to know officer, right. and therefore mm -hmm. there is an opportunity cost. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the borough's right to know officer. It means that um, finding and filling requests takes up my time, mm -hmm. um, takes up Michelle Carroll's time to manage and administer the program. We get about, on average, one right to know request a week. And probably, you know, 85% of them are um, quick and easy to fill, but it's the other 15% that make up 85 to 90% of the work. You do track each right to know request we get in. We put an estimate of the number of hours that we put in for each right to know request. Um, we could provide that information to council if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally we do. Um, lately now with more frequency, to be honest, uh, incur solicitor's fees because if we're going to deny any uh, right to know request, um, I'd like to run it past the solicitor. Um, we've had to go through very large amounts of emails for one particular request that involved hours of the solicitor's time um, mm -hmm. to verify if there was anything in there that could, could be withheld or should be withheld. We had to do a lot with pre-decisional deliberations, which uh, is something that um, can be, doesn't have to be provided by the municipality under the right to know law. There's certain exceptions to, uh, to information that you provide, and a lot of it has to do with um, the communications or the records that have to do with decision-making, pre-decisional decision making where if you're sending an email to somebody and you're asking them their opinion on something um, or papers or documents that have to do with budget development is another example of things that uh, could be withheld from a right to know request but large a large part of what we um, research and provide is uh, we do and we don't run into that problem too often but we do we, it is a substantial amount of time and money um, that we invest both my time and Michelle's time and John Walco's time for those denials, mm -hmm. or partial denials, if we get something in where. Um, the, the other difficult thing to manage with right to know requests is there's really no limit on the size and scope of, of, of a request. Um, uh, we had one request where uh, an individual wanted all burn, building permit records back to 1982. So that involves some solicitor time to get back to that person to, re to deny that request on the grounds that it wasn't speci specific to what they were looking yeah. for, and we would need some sort of security up, in, up front. There are costs involved. We can charge for paper copies um, when they're requested. But we cannot charge for solicitor dollars. No. Or no, we save your time. We eat a lot of, we eat 95 cents on the dollar, we eat on right to know requests. And I can't, I can't comfortably say what the total amount can be because you, every once in a while you can get these big, um, you get like a big request. And, it, and I have some requests that, have, that are, I have one request that's up above 45 hours and counting and has solicitor time on top of it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's significant, 45 hours of my time and Michelle's time. Well, sure, it's 45 hours of your time that you're not spending. It's a week. That's a week. Yeah. <laughs> that's a week of work. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, yeah. and I will get that email back to the citizen. Um, I, I had a question. Does anybody have any right to know questions? Well, I, I'm, I'm just glad we had that conversation because yeah. the public should know and the cost. As clarification, also, I think it's important to say that when you hear the borough manager saying can be withheld, and you're thinking, well, okay, but why are you withholding it? I mean, sometimes there are very, very good reasons to not put things into the public domain that are, are sh not, not because the borough wants to hide something, but because they could negatively impact the borough. Not the borough employees, but the borough itself and our position in potentially an adversarial relationship or our ability to negotiate. And so that's the kind of withholding. I th when people hear withhold, I think they mean, they think, I think they may hear trying to keep secrets as opposed yeah. to trying to make um, well informed decisions about what things might potentially be harmful to our mm -hmm. shared interests. I just wanted to clarify that because I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding about that. And Thank I'm you. sure you don't withhold everything that you could legally withhold. Also, it's not oh, it's not purely a legal decision. Yeah, right? it's not it's, an exact science. It's a pragmatic either. decision, and it's a it's it's a it's one that's informed by trying to do what's the best thing for the borough. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a quick question about um, a budget line, and I thought that maybe you could answer it quickly yeah, here sure. versus the whole about the price crossing. Okay. We had an email from neighbors concerned about the guardrail. Mm -hmm. So I saw in the budget line, it looks like price crossing that property um, allocated approximately $2,100 to the guardrail. And then there's a landscaping $39,000 line item on that. Do any of those landscaping funds, are they going to address the very eyesore of the guardrail? Um, what you're talking about is the escrow release that's yes. in our meeting package, yeah. mm -hmm. and yes. when a land development starts, there's a sum of money withheld in, in a third party uh, account mm -hmm. to pay for public yes. improvements yeah, that, yes. that, that, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that would need to be done in case the developer goes back, belly right. up or walks away from the project. And one of those items, you're correct, is landscaping. And we've heard the complaints about the guardrail, we've investigated, and we looked and we saw that there is an opportunity for some, a modification to the approved landscape plan. And so we're having a conversation with the project manager at, uh, at that development. Landscaping is typically one of the last things that gets mm -hmm. installed, sure. so it's not something that's gonna get solved tomorrow, but right. what we'd like to see is um, some treatment on the, there's no room to do it on the inbound side, the, the side of the guardrail mm -hmm. that's next to the road, but there might be, there's, there is room to do some kind of treatment on the other side so that residents on, on that other side won't have to look at the back of, back of the guardrail. And uh, so we're having a conversation that the approved landscape plan doesn't have any landscaping in that spot and the approved land development plan called for and specified this type of guardrail so we don't have mm -hmm. like legal authority to make them do something but this is one of those things where we will want to have we want to keep a good relationship have a conversation mm -hmm. and get them to um, bend a little bit and and make a reasonable accommodation and sure. so that's what we're working on right now okay thanks i just wanted to follow up on this even. um okay uh, then the first informational item to discuss is the communication plan. So last month, we identified um, avenues of communication and culture that we would like to see improved and addressed. And you all saw that list. We reported it out. We created it. You were away, Michelle, but I know that you had offered some feedback. Following the flow chart that we all agreed on, the office met um, and staff and came up with a uh, communication plan and you really approached it differently than we did so maybe I can ask you to share that with folks um, um, we have our April agenda in front of you. Second, sorry well I can tell you where we're at we're kind of we're at the same place we were two weeks ago because we haven't had time to work on it in the last two weeks but what we met to discuss was um, 
and what is what's on my my plate is to create a you know a chart of what kinds of information we're going to be pushing out and what formats we're going to push it out into, and with what um, cadence or regularity we're going to do that. So we've got uh, the email, the blog on the website. Um, uh, a newsletter down the road, not immediately, a newsletter down the road, and um, our information boards. So we're looking at it in print and electronic media formats, and we're looking at the types of information we want to push out on those different formats. And until we've got that, until I've populated this this list of what we want to have and where, we'll, we'll, um, we'll keep doing what we're doing presently. Uh, so the, the thought is in that Sean and I hope to have something that we can um, bring to the full table at the next workshop meeting and that we can all discuss. And part of the conversation that Sean and I had that actually didn't happen when we had our committee meeting was that, you know, I hope that as a full council that we can look not only as the office but also as a council table. So agendas are created and posted online from committee chairs, um, meetings you know, minute meetings are posted and um, given within a proper time frame for all committee meetings, council committee meetings. Um, you know, additionally, as part of the conversation that Sean and I are having, you know, I wonder if as a council we have a conversation that, you know, maybe we have open houses as council members, you know, that we have citizens that might have an interest in talking to us, but it's not really something appropriate for a public comment. Right, it really is a question. So if we're asking the office to increase communication because we ask both for avenues of information and a cultural examination of you know everything from um, customer service to website culture and presence, that perhaps we take a look at how we do that as council members as well. And I think that's something that if you agree upon, we should just bring to the larger table for a discussion about this priority. Mm -hmm. um, per our kind of flow chart that we agreed on, and I, I mapped this out, just handwritten and posted it from last week, but that center column is really who are the stakeholders that should be involved in this conversation. Certainly the Narborough Civic Association is, I think, one of our biggest advocates on information. But I did go to the Narborough Business Association meeting <coughs> after our workshop to talk about how we can help the NBA, particularly in this time of the bridge, and the construction downtown, how can we help communicate? Um, and that's, I think, a stakeholder group that has to be considered and involved. Um, one of the things that we talked about was re-examination of the role of an information officer within the borough um, and how to reposition mm -hmm. that role. Uh, and then also, how can the borough council support the Norbert Business Association in a really clear and organized way? you know, with an MOU, uh, with an agreement of this is how it is appropriate for the council to support our downtown and put it in a really concise... What information officer? I don't know. Um, I, can you explain what that means? I don't know what that means. Uh, so we Sorry. have um, Ed Bridgeway is oh. currently hired as the information oh, officer. Oh, is that his title? Okay. Yeah, yeah that, got it. Okay. Is a Thank version you. of his title? I'm not sure he has a title. All right, well, we can call it that. Now, now I know what it ref refers to. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Okay. And, you know, part of this is that we should have roles. You know, it shouldn't be the Edward way or the in, insert any name that now that we are professionalizing, we professionalize the staff, our police force, uh, we should really think about these things not so much as individuals, but as, as roles and, and, yes. and MOUs and expectations. And I think that protects everyone. Anything to add for the communication plan? No, we'll have more on the fifth. We'll have a we'll have a busy meeting on the fifth. A lot of big things to talk about. Right. Okay. Um, the next is the parking management plan. I put this. Which is one of those things. One of those things. <laughs> and I'm not even sure that we should have this discussion right now. Other to other than to say that I think that um, F and A, it's appropriate for us to really consider any type of fees, whether it be a fee for the parking permit, whether it be a visitor parking fee at any point, particularly if there's revenue implications, uh, that it's appropriate for this community to maybe do a little research and talk about that policy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I see parking is cutting across all three communities. They do. And hopefully at the meeting tonight, we could talk about how that'll be organized a little bit better because there should be some clarity on who is picking up what piece of this parking priority. 
Okay. Does the do you, does the committee or wanted to discuss a um, recommendation for the resolution tonight in terms of pricing and time limit for the NYT permit? I am nowhere near prepared to make that recommendation at this point. Um, other than to say that I am not at all comfortable or support charging for visiting passes at this time. Yeah, I don't feel like I can make your like I I don't think that this committee has right now the information or the background has done the research mm -hmm. put in legwork to be able to make a recommendation in terms of fees and how they relate to the bigger, broader budgetary and financial you know, picture of the borough, which is really what this committee will be limiting mm -hmm. itself to if it's making a recommendation. Right? I'm just yeah. talking about our personal opinions. I don't think that this committee is the right forum for that. Um, so that's what I think about these. <laughs> Okay. But, but you know, I could imagine this committee also weighing in on the form of the, you know, beyond just the fees, like how the fees are collected, no, no, no. you know, um, the administration of the system. Yeah. Agreed. So well, so, I mean, I, I'm not uncomfortable necessarily with there being a fee, um, but I don't, I'm not, I don't think I support what seems to be the proposal at this time <coughs> that the fee is too high for a visitor permit. Yeah. Um, and I think administratively to have to renew it weekly is not, I think that does not match with the way visitors actually happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, daily or weekly, uh, because there may be different categories, right? There may be some visitors, if that makes sense, right? but there may be, um, in many cases, a need for a longer term. Um, solution and a little bit more flexibility, something that isn't tied to one um, discrete visit that lasts a certain amount yeah. of time, but something that, that can extend over time. So I'm not, but those are, you know, those are big, those are bigger questions. And uh, is it is it if it's unfair of me to ask in this setting, I'll, I'll retract the question. But is are you all in favor of uh, getting the privilege the privileged parking ordinance done in, in essentially creating the residential invitee permit but you have a hesitancy about um, what it should be priced at or what its terms should be or do you yeah. want to kind of or are you sort of don't want to deal with that tonight no I would say that and I retract that question if you'd rather talk about it yeah, that, that table describes seven. my, yeah, my position <laughs> what you said describes my position I'm Which open to the ordinance or <laughs> but I could still be convinced at the table that even the ordinance might mm -hmm. might not be the right move so, this week. But yes. so I I wanted to ask Matt about it because I know he's been really interested in parking policy and, and what you described to me. But I don't want to misrepresent it. I'm glad you're here today. Is that um, the vendor from whom we purchased our current parking management system, which seems like it's the bomb, really, gave us some advice, which is that if you maintain your sort of visitor list, your ad hoc sort of off the books kind of kept in paper visitor list parallel to the system that you're now managing, which would basically, um, tell me if I'm misrepresenting, uh, basically send violations directly to the court system through the, through the linkage of the license plate number that's linked to the, the, the state right. database, right? If you maintain that in parallel, you're, you're sort of running a risk that somebody can challenge a ticket saying, well, we got this visitor list. I wasn't on the visitor list. I could. So, so you, you kind of don't want to have a, a clear system that's, that's database driven and that's, that's, that's linked to the core system and then this sort of ad hoc thing on the side. And that seems like really prudent advice and like really smart. Right? I agree. Um, whether, whether we can get rid of the visitor list before we have something in place is maybe a different question. Mm -hmm. um, because the worst for running is the risk that some tickets won't get enforced, which has been the status quo for a long time anyway. So, I mean, that, that is one possible easy fix. Just put it back until we figure it out. I mean, if that's the best we can do. Um, but, you know, maybe as a, as a full council at the table, we can come up with a better mm -hmm. solution that gets visitor, which we want. Visitor permit parking is is it, is it, is it the only concern I have with the ordinance was that the, the definition of residential invitee is very broad. Another thing we talked about yesterday, and I thought, well, residential invitee could mean, you know, somebody stopping by for the weekend, a contractor who's going to be there for three weeks, you know, working on your bathroom, or, you know, somebody who's going to be there most of the days of the year as a home health care aide or, you know, a, a nanny or whatever. So there's, there's different categories, and it's not clear we would always need to, to treat those things the same way from a permitting point of view, or maybe we would. 
Um, these are conversations that need to be had, but for a short-term solution, it seems to me creating a broad category that permits us to establish a system that doesn't, you know, that, that allows you to sort of move forward and, and enforce the tickets that, that we'd like to enforce, which to keep, which really are ultimately to protect parking for residents, and that's the ultimate goal. If there wasn't a problem. If we didn't have a train station, we didn't have a problem of, of people's having their parking taken. Mm -hmm. you know, by people who aren't residents, I think we would just say, okay, fine, everybody should park where you want, we're done. Yeah. But that's, it's to protect that. And so um, if you want to protect that, you have to have a carve out for your guests, or else your guests are going to get tickets because there's no way for our parking enforcement officer to know, mm -hmm. is, this, is this a train commuter or is this a guest? So yeah, I think we, we should provide for that. Um, that was really helpful. Question? Yes, I think, yes, I would like to see us be able to do that. I'd like to be able to see, see us craft something that at least gets us to the next step. I think there are a lot of bigger questions that may maybe need to be addressed in a different way. In a, in a, but for now, I, I hope we can find something. At least gets us back to having a, a system of permitting for guests. For guests. But, but that does, does not then negate the much larger questions of looking at the parking study data that really questions some of the two-hour zones. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I would hate to see us pass something as a short-term fix, which that was important to contextualize that, and not address the holistic issue we have with parking as it stands right now. I hope we can put in place a process for the next step. You know, looking at the parking study in more depth with resident input and sort of bring, bring, bring I hate this word, multiple stakeholders <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> together. But you know, that is that is it's it's a good word, you know, to sort of take take a look at that. The one thing that they, you know that, that I always took out of that the recommendations of, of the parking study was that we should try to avoid what we call we should try to avoid a lot of ad changes and ad hoc temporary fixes. But right. that's kind of what we're looking at doing now, but you know, I think it would be necessary for you know for reasons that we talked about, but you know, I hope we can put in place a process so that the next the next look time we look at this, whenever it is, maybe a few months down the road, I don't know, mm -hmm. it's it's on the basis of some comprehensive recommendations that look at the entire parking system as a, as a whole. And, and I am not at this time at all comfortable assigning a, a, a fee, any change in cost, without doing that comprehensive evaluation of parking. Mm -hmm. At this time, okay. Yeah, no, like I say, I'm open to the ordinance, but I'm not comfortable with the resolution. Right now, the resolution is anything. Right. <laughs> it's just right. blank. <laughs> well, to play devil's advocate, if you pass the ordinance without the resolution, you leave discretion entirely in the hands of the borough manager. <laughs> Evil laugh. <laughs> so, what if we passed it with zero fee? Then it'll be prone to abuse. How many do you possibly get? I think I asked this at the public safety meeting before the last public safety, and it, you said 10, 11? Yeah, max we had was about 19 in a month. Average is about 12 a month. Right. On a long-term basis, I agree with you. I don't think that's probably a good solution long-term, but perhaps to get to the point where we can have some peace with parking. Our parking enforcement officer being able to distinguish between people who cannot being put in the middle of having no system to enforce. So the right. ordinance won't work without the resolution? No, and a resolution... The resolution but... defines the parameters. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't saying... And then saying the resolution, no resolution is really the meat and potatoes. So, like, mm -hmm. the, the ordinance is just establishing a framework that we can work with. Mm -hmm. it, it means, okay, we can, we can account for visitors. That makes the legal part of it mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. The resolution is where council really needs to dive in and define what do you want? What do you want it to be? What are the parameters you want it to be? Time, cost, so, any of those things. As a council member, I, I know what I would tell you right now if, it was, if I was like the king, the queen. You know, I, I, but I don't think that anybody... My sense is that the reason we haven't reached a decision is that probably nobody on council is comfortable dictating that without having more of an interactive process mm -hmm. with residents, who ultimately this policy really is for, and you know, who benefit mm -hmm. from it, and, and the businesses, who, and, and who, and businesses, right? Yeah. Residents and businesses. I think, I think that we need to have uh, a bigger. We need to set something up where we have 
conversation and figure out what works. And then, then I'm comfortable moving forward with it. I don't want to impose my personal views on a policy like this that's very, kind of really touches people on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I get that. It's a kind of one, two, you know, so, but I, I mean, we're clearly at the council, we're not ready to, I mean, we just started this conversation, so we're not at a point where we can set the fees, the duration, the form. No, I mean, you know, one clear theme that came out of my meeting with the Narvith Business Association is how the bridge being closed is affecting customers, right, and access. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is hopefully temporary, but hopefully, very soon, we will have the bridge closed for an extended amount of time while it gets replaced. You know, we're talking about two-hour zones right on that south side as well, where not only is there a residential impact, but perhaps we should be thinking about those customers that come, want to park and run across through the tunnel and purchase something as well, um, or maybe get their hair done over two hours. You know, um, I think there's a lot to consider, not only Michelle, I think you perfectly outlined that, but also we should be thinking about the change that's happening in the community and how that may affect that two-hour zone differently than you know it, it did at the time of the study. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, should, we should probably table this here and bring it over to our next meeting at this point to continue this conversation. Unless you have anything. Okay, so we move to action items then? Yeah, sure. I'm ready if you are. Okay. Go for it. I mean, minutes. Less than Any questions? <laughs> Schedule fills. On the things that will be mostly, I yeah. mean, this committee does get <clears throat> the bulk of the um, action items typically from month to month. So. Mm -hmm. Um, comprehensive plan. My only question is, did anyone call? We extended the time so the public had an opportunity to read the comprehensive plan. The um, kiosk posters looked great, whoever did those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. County, they looked great. Um, I'm just curious, did anyone come in, call, or did we look at clips? Did it make any difference extending it a month? So, so we don't get any compliments. We just get the complaints. Is that how it works? That's, I'm just that's, answering the question. That's the nature of public <laughs> service. Okay. Well, we can say we gave everyone another month. I was thinking perhaps a you know plane like at the beach. As well. I want uh, a dirigible. I want a dirigible. Everybody laughs at it. You see, it's referred to in the resolution as the 2040 compressive plan. It's <laughs> yeah. important too. Time space and time. Okay, um, privileged parking resolution. We're obviously going to talk about that at the full table. Okay. Unless anybody has anything else to add. Let's see. Uh, preliminary plans for Haverford and Forest. Anything? Um, price, oh, price. Okay, I already asked you about that escrow release. Anything we need to know about that, Sean, other than what you described? Uh, just keep in mind that the, they're getting closer and closer to being done. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll, it'll probably be another five months, four or five months, and I think they'll be substantially complete. I don't know if they've sold all the units yet, no. because I don't know for sure, but um, they're getting close to being done, and, and, and that, the moment they're done, so to speak, isn't, isn't mean they're done. There is a, uh, typically a 12-month period at the... Uh, close the construction where we hold about 10 or 15 percent in contingency and that typically goes to anything that breaks in that first year. Um, soil can settle, paving can fail, curbs can fail, trees can die, all those things get replaced in that year year to 18 month period and then at that point you sign the, the complete release and everybody everybody walks away and now it's, it's private property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the bid, the bid on sale? Yeah, the, any questions Stand about up. that? This, all we are voting on tonight is authorizing the borough mm -hmm. to put this out to bid. We won't know what we get back um, until we put it out there. Uh, just keep in mind that the schedule, um, I'll go print out for myself after this for committee. Anyone wants over. It's just for the roofing work. When you hear Sabine, that's what it's for, not mm -hmm. anything else. Just. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's per it's very comprehensive, and as soon as we, it, assuming council approves it and it goes out to bid, we'll put it on our website, and persons can dig into the details. It's a total reconstruction of the um, entire roof eave and soffit system on the complex. It's, it's a lot of lot of metal work to to make that happen, and then. Um, the, the roof is being replaced over the three-story educational building, all the way down to the deck. And there is some limited um, roof replacements where the sampling showed uh, moisture penetration and also a completion of a, of a sort of a temporary, not temporary, but a, but a, um, a roofing overlay system. Mm -hmm over certain areas of the roof. We had been doing that. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've done quite a bit of that work over the last few years and this uh, bid would complete that work, uh, which is just basically rolling out a, um, um, a, a coating that's applied with heat and adheres to the roof surface and gives you another 10, 15 years on the roof. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else? No, um, I, if all goes as planned, the, um, the bid opening will be June 12th, and that would put our um, vote to uh, recommend award the bid at our next business meeting. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we get, we get reasonable, well-qualified contractors and, and a good, uh, good bid list. We have, we have about 35 um, roofers in our in our queue right now that we're going to direct market the, the job to. So. Good luck. I have better luck than I do for my house. <laughs> uh, you know what I should ask though as we're talking about this? How about the, the bid for the vertical shielding? Are we prepared yet to put that out? Or are we not in that position we're yet? Still, we're still getting into focus the total cost of that project because I'll talk more about that at the meeting because we okay. have the bridge to discuss, but just to give you a little preview, um, the vertical shielding has to be done and the bird engineer is also recommending that there be a partial demolition of the outbound or western sidewalk woven into that that project. Okay. So uh, okay. We're sort of like getting a little bit closer in, in what I think the, the final dollar value range will be. Um, it's too early to say. I want to be within maybe Ten or fifteen thousand dollars when I start mentioning a number, and just by mentioning that, I'm telling you, it's it's <laughs> you know it's not nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't want to I don't want to put a number out there until until we, we have it in a pretty narrow range, and it comes from the engineer. Um, Bob, this is probably technically an infrastructure question, but can I ask about the bike grant? If we've heard back. Uh, we were um, some financial indication. We've had some. Um, I've been back and forth with the uh, grantors at the county. They asked some clarifying questions about about the project, mostly about whether whether or not, how close we were and whether or not we had specific specific plans for Windsor Avenue yet. And we don't. Um, but uh, I, I will check on that in time for our meeting, if not sooner. Um, about when, when their deadline is. I don't know off the top of my head okay. when decisions were supposed to be made. But I think their, com their que queries and questions and reviews are complete at this mm -hmm. point. They haven't Good. called yeah. it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the only thing that I did forget to mention to you all, we had talked about facilitating um, a meet and greet between um, the developers at Forest and Haverford, uh, Mr. Rudin and Mr. Keegan, with the Narvik businesses. And at the NBA mm -hmm. meeting, all the business owners said that they were really interested in that. So we are very close Good. to finding a date. It was May 30th, and there was a snafu. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I get that final date, um, I will let FNA and council know. It's really just us coordinating a time so the businesses can you know, put a name to a face. Mm -hmm. um, so the good developers idea. can yeah. understand that idea. they're investing good. in this really valuable community. Um, and we're just going to be the, the facilitators of that. 
the thank coordinator. You. I thank should you say. for doing that. It's, it's a good idea because there will. This is inevitably that things are going to come up during the construction process. It's good if they've got and they know each other. names with faces. <laughs> and, and as I said at the Nervous Business Association, guess what? The, the businesses need more shoppers and people, and the developers need a thriving downtown. Right? Mm -hmm. They're not investing these beautiful new buildings in a town with vacant stores. So it's really a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. And that is not a public meet and greet. That is purely so the businesses have the yeah. time and yeah. attention of these properties to understand how to make it as painless as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, stay tuned for that date. OK? And then if that's it. Should be, all right, so we're done. Our agenda. We're done our agenda. So any other comments or public comment? Public. I, no. I'm wondering if with the time we have, we should. I, Talk about the park department plan more, <laughs> only because it's 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 possible. I I, I don't. Nobody wants to. <laughs> nobody wants to bite this off. It's possible that it would be helpful if we if there were a recommend. I don't know. Do you think it would be helpful if there were a recommendation from this committee, given where we are positioned in terms of going in with a blank resolution? Um, if there were, a, if if this committee were, to, may it may or may not. Do what we decide on, but if this committee were to come in with something that was like more concrete, do you think that would help the process? Wouldn't hurt. Yeah, because otherwise we get right. <laughs> well put. Uh, right, because otherwise it's it's potentially a real a really difficult thing to resolve at the table with seven people. It's going to be kind of people. I, I wonder if we should take a little time to just sort of chew on this uh, since we've got some time. Can we do that? Sure. Yeah, we have a half an hour. We have the resolution. 23 minutes. I mean, it's um, yeah. now therefore be it resolved the application fee for privileged parking shall be as follows blank. Now therefore be it further resolved that the duration of time established for the purpose of permitting an owner or lessee of a residential dwelling or residential inventory of the same to park along the affected areas shall be. <laughs> That's what I was <laughs> So maybe this is why we can I like be helpful. helpful. <laughs> the blanks. <laughs> So, uh, what do you think? Why would, I guess, how would you fill in the blanks? Yeah. I'm just bringing it up. It's just, I mean, let's just pretend it's a workshop. I'm going to go nowhere. <laughs> Why would you fill in the blanks? 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 So, I think the, the way I can think about this is running through different scenarios. So, say you have a painter, mm -hmm. and the painter has their Nolan painting van. And they have two other employees that come in their private cars. So three vehicles in front of the house for seven days. But only one is marked as a contractor. It's obviously a contract. Mm -hmm. So what's, what, what's, how, do, how do we deal with that? I think a weekly, a weekly system and a weekly charge system for somebody who's like a contractor who's coming in here doing business, making money, and they're not going to be here long term. I'm very comfortable with that. I'm very comfortable with that. So we would, that would have required two or three passes that you buy on a weekly basis. But that's only in some two-hour zones, and we know right. that some of the two-hour zones make no sense. So I, I guess that's where I go back to. We still have a we. I know we're, we're talking about a temporary a temporary po a policy to allow. That allows the office to be able to issue visitor permits in a way that's at least our, makes sense. Yes. Yeah. 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 We, we would go website to You can turn the parking zone layer on. Okay. Oh, okay. Because that would be, I think that should be the first thing that's established that this whole discussion is limited to the two hour zones. Well, right? I mean, because I think most people are assuming that it applies to everyone. Right. Well, I mean, Robin doesn't go along with ticket people in this. Visit parking limitation on the street. So. But I don't, I don't think that's obvious to everybody. So. No, I don't think You're it's... probably right, yeah. You know, so, I mean, that, just to kind of narrow the scope of what we're discussing. I mean, I think, I, I, I live on a, right, we live on a non-two-hour street. I think everybody on our street is well aware of the fact that you don't have to get a permit when somebody parks on the street. We just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't hurt to clarify. <laughs> So can right. I help? So can I help that would be a contract. That would be a contract. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's what here's what I learned from the parking study. It was in seventeen. We started. We authorized in sixteen. Didn't seventeen. We know we know that parking has some kind of value, some kind of monetary mm -hmm. value. Um, we're not really sure what it is. Mm -hmm. We know it's not free. 
we know it's not seventy dollars a month because that's what Montgomery Court Apartments at the time was charging for right. their spaces, right. and, and they weren't getting utilized to the at nearly to the extent that all of the on-street spaces mm -hmm. were being utilized in that area. So we have to find a number that's somewhere between zero and eight hundred and forty dollars a year. So. And that is why we need to find that's the economic analysis, which is true. Um, parking does have a price, and it is somewhere between zero and seventy dollars a month, as far as we find it. Okay, I'll, but, I'll, Matt, I'll. I'm sorry. Can you interrupt? I, I mean, to our communication point, I can't find this parking on our. It's there. I, well, I'm sure, but so, uh, uh, easily information uh, plans well, you can presentation. A well, perfect. <laughs> that would be a lot easier. But okay, so talking through scenarios then, and you know, this is interesting. But there's also, there's also a question of whether or not we would, we as a community in this council, would want to charge the market rate for that good, that public good, mm -hmm. for every application, for every use. Or whether we would only be comfortable charging it for some applications and some uses. Or whether we'd like to give people the opportunity to use that public good for a nominal rate up to a point. But when you go beyond that point, then we, want, then, then we want to sort of put in a market price. So here's another piece of information and variable for you. Um, yeah. We don't know how many residential permits there would be. Mm -hmm. Our best guess is it might be, could be 800, could be 400, could mm -hmm. be 500 permits, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know with our present system how many of those old permits we issued, like in the mm -hmm. 16, have just sort of timed out. Mm -hmm. People have moved out. Mm -hmm. Cars have changed. Maybe they didn't get a. Maybe they didn't get a replacement. <coughs> We're talking about residential permits versus the investors. Hmm? Okay. We're talking about residential permits. Do because we I think the price of the residential permit. The invitee price kind of is connected to and derives from from that. That's what you're saying. Okay, so keeping this with your the, this is the math with the layers on. So I mean, it, it shows for for our street, Michelle, for example, it's showing that the 200 block is a two-hour zone. Is that right? No. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Well, the 200 block is the 100 block is it? You're on the 100 block. Well, no, that's what I said. The 200 block. Yes, the 200 block is. Yeah. Okay. Recently, they. So that's 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 where I saw the Nolan painting then today with yes. two cars yes. for two employees. Okay, so. so keeping with your Nolan paint example. Okay, so you make a point. Guess what? If, you, if if the painters were to come to Philadelphia, the painter and the contractors and subsequent cars would be paying for parking. One way or another. Okay. So how do you differentiate between? Okay, I can I hear that argument, but now you have a death in the family, and your mother's coming in and she's staying with you. For a week, so we're charging, you know, Aunt Rose to park her car market value like we are in Philadelphia. So, if I had to propose a system, it would be this. Okay, it would be that any ad key to addresses, not license plates, not specific vehicles, that any address there's about nine, 16, 1900 distinct residential units in the borough, something like that would be able to purchase for whatever fee, something higher than. Or, tagged to the residential permit fee, a visitor permit in the form of something flexible in the form of a hang tag that moved from car to car. I mean, I think that would probably resolve like 90% of the need. And then you might have, and you know, if that served your contractor, fine. Maybe they have one van, okay. Put, the, put up to a certain size vehicle. I think you would want oversized trucks to be able to use it. You'd put a limit on what kind of vehicle mm -hmm. that could cover. And that would probably, people would sort of work that out for the most part, you know, like that would cover your aunt who's coming in to visit, your home care, health care worker, the contractor with one truck, you know, small truck, that would be fine. For the exceptional circumstances, then there, then there would probably need to be, um, you know, a system to purchase additional permits, short, shorter term permits, permits for exceptional circumstances, you know, event parking. Um, you have five contractor vehicles coming because it's a big project. And yeah, I would think the price for that, maybe maybe the price point would be higher. Maybe it would be the same, but just the, the price point would be the same, but the duration would be longer. I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I can't make those decisions solely on my own, but that would be the kind of system that I think would mm -hmm. make sense. It would meet, it would kind of, it would, it, would, um, it would be aligned with the way people actually use parking for guests. Mm -hmm. I mean, the concern I have is, is having a system that's limited and it has to be like 
this this particular license plate for one day or for a week creates a very cumbersome system for residents, for users. And, and as we discuss this, I am thinking only of Do the current even... hours of enforcement, not well, yeah, the extended so hours. Nice. Because oh, the extended yeah, hours blows up this whole conversation. I don't think we're talking. That's not, that's not in the resolution or the ordinance. I don't think we're approaching that policy tonight. But that would affect how I think about the business. Well, yeah. We're not changing it. But, so that would have to, we, that's something else that we should clarify in the meeting, that the hours of enforcement are it's status quo. I, I don't see anything like that would change that's been changed this time. Well, part of it is the Wednesday meeting discussion mm -hmm. is, is like, you know, maybe confusing some folks in terms of what we would vote on today. You know, some folks listen. Mm -hmm. So can you explain that from an economic standpoint? Why charge for visitors pass other than this idea of market rate parking, which I'm not sure I'm even comfortable with that. Why charge for it? Mm -hmm. Because uh, because then that would be the de facto permit everyone would, would be coming right. in to get. Right. The free <laughs> permit. Would, I mean, do we really think there would be a flood of, what, train commuters that would find somebody to get them a visitor parking lot? Like, no, why would you pay $50 for a residential permit when you could call up the office and get a um, free invitee permit for your car? Well, of course I wouldn't charge $50 for a parking permit. But why wouldn't I just pay the $2 for my parking permit like I do right now? Or the $20 or whatever well, we come up with. If the invitee program required you to renew it every week, I mean, I think the question answers itself because it's a pain yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. backside. <laughs> Whereas your, your residential permit lasts a year. Probably on that basis alone, most people would pay the money. But, um, but, if, but if it wasn't, if it wasn't that, if it was you know, residential permit, it was an invitee permit, that you could move from car to car and be good for a year. I, I don't have any problem charging a nominal, a, a, a relatively <coughs> low fee for all of them. I don't. I don't think. I don't see why resident. Why why a guest permit that you buy it, that you can put on any guest mm -hmm. card should be free when your residential permit costs money. I mean, it, either 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 it's a public good that costs money that we charge for in order to you know to ensure that it's wisely used or it's not. So. But your answer was then to deter fraud. So you charge to do You can fraud. make it the same. You can make whatever the residential permit fee is they the same. It could be the same. It could be the same. Be a, as it'd be a fine as place to start. The tag. Simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, again, I just think this is so complex. And, it is. And that it is. it's not as easy as saying, what are we going to charge this? And starting with the idea that, do we all agree that parking is a public commodity? That's where we need to start. And, and that has to be discussed as what is the value system of our community. You know, someone brought up to me, you know, parking storage. And I thought that was fascinating. You shouldn't be able to, to get free parking storage. So for folks that have a driveway and have four or five cars and keep four or five cars while kids are in college, let's say, stored on a street, well, now that made sense to me. You, you are, in fact, using a public good for private storage. I think it would make sense to have a, a scale, you know, have gradations on the permit system. Well, you know, the first permit costs X, second permit for this address, right. Y, third permit. You know, whatever. A sliding scale. I mean, it seems to me, I think it makes sense. I don't know what, I think there was some concern expressed that that would not be, that would be too difficult to enforce, or it would be too easy to work around, I'm not sure. I think sometimes the fact that the fact that we can foresee that something might be difficult to implement or that people may find workarounds to put it in a value neutral way isn't necessarily a reason not to do it. Because that might really rule out doing a lot of things because in practice almost nothing rolls out perfectly. Um, I, I agree. And, and I, I don't want to see us come up with a policy just driven by the handful of folks that are going to do a workaround. I guess this is just to conclude that I was not at the public safety meeting because I was ill, but I did watch it. Mm -hmm. so, and it, we just haven't had a discussion on this. So yeah, well, it, the challenge tonight is to kind of cordon off the pieces that we would actually vote on exactly. tonight right, yeah. from the much larger discussion that was introduced Wednesday. Uh -huh. And it's just impossible to sort out 
larger picture tonight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, <coughs> well, that, that's the What dilemma. could we resolve tonight that would allow us to move forward? What could we resolve us that, that what, what could we decide as council tonight that would, um, what, what do you need the council to decide specifically in order to implement a residential invite to permit system? Cost and, need, time frame. Need, cost and time right, just for residential invitees right we could keep the existing residential permits exactly as that we don't need to change mm -hmm. that. cost and time frame so residential invitee cost and time and the cost frame. can be zero mm -hmm. and the time frame can stay status quo it can be whatever you want it to be that, sure the law well, we need, need to enact the ordinance of course yes this is but, assuming the ordinance and, and again right. if it was done by resolution you could come back next month and change that resolution mm -hmm. to right. something else if you wanted to. If it, and, and I think it's without incurring any expense or time. And I think so, it's really important to explain the voting on the ordinance just allows us to then have the conversation that we're moving forward with, with action, but, and it's the resolution that we then can assign. Us. The question of duration mm -hmm. is entirely different if you're talking about a permit that is associated with an address or a resident. An individual or an individual dwelling unit versus a permit that is associated with a given vehicle. And we're talking about invitees. I mean, they're totally radically different things. We're getting really far into the weeds on that. And we'll leave it, if we want to have that conversation, there's the giant element that we haven't even talked about is the enforcement approach. Many of these things that you're talking about really depends on how we enforce in the field. I like the idea of a, an annual visitor permit hang tag for it that's uh, associated to an address. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to work, the enforcement strategy has to change. Right. It's difficult to enforce a hang tag in a two-hour zone, whereas if an entire two-hour zone is just permit parking, you have to have a permit to park here or have the hang tag. Mm -hmm. The enforcement part of it, and I am certainly not an enforcement officer, would be going down a block and seeing which vehicles have hang tags and which ones don't, mm -hmm. as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if we really want to have this conversation, we have to include the police department, mm -hmm. the enforcement angle on it, because they are the ones who are mm -hmm. actually on the ground mm -hmm. doing it. So, okay, so right now from f &A, if we, let's say, recommended zero, right? Mm -hmm. No cost, just like right now, same hours, and that was in a resolution, that would change nothing of our current system, which is people call it in and you get 19 a month what's or a week. When people call in, what's the duration of the permit that they receive? Permission, I should say. It was whatever that person wanted. Okay. Hmm. So we could vote zero, same time, zero cost. That would allow us to keep this status quo until we can have this larger conversation. We'd need a time frame, like what, not, you know, cost is zero, and is it going to be a day, a week? We also need to have that. And we can have multiples. We can have a day pass is zero. We can have a week is zero. The system is designed in a way that we need buckets. Okay. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that's how we manage it. That's how we push the data out into the field for the enforcement officer, license plate driven, mm -hmm. whatever bucket that is, mm -hmm. and it all times it based upon. Mm -hmm. I think a license plate driven system for visitors doesn't work. Mm. I think it really is, will never meet the need because that's just sort of, by, by definition, it's going to put the burden for getting permits. It's going to, it's going to push it back on people and it's, it's going to create the need to like, because people's needs are very flexible in that regard. When someone's coming to visit, you don't even know the license plate. I got to get you a parking pass. You get a ticket. I'm texting you. What's your license plate? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm at the mall. I don't remember it. I'll, I'll text you back. I mean, people. That's not the way people function. That's not the way residential. So sort of, that's not the way that need functions. It makes total sense for residents. We all know our license plates are going to be worth parking in the same street for a year. Right? Well, but we can find them out, and then it's a long-term yeah. relationship. But this sort of need to have some kind of flexible system in place. But this is what I'm saying. I, that is such a larger conversation for right now and tonight. I'm just wondering if we could pass the question of what we needed to do, this, whatever the buckets are. It's, it's free for a day, for a week, for a month. 
whatever right now at zero with this time frame could we pass that tonight just so you have yeah. something so we can we can so, so what, what is the form of the pass is it hang tag or is it license plate well no it's license plate at license. the moment license plate. Hmm? and then we have this much larger so that would conversation be the solution so we're still going to have people calling the office to do it under this oh so they, okay is so that, you can or do that. Is there we a way can to call do it okay. instead of people going online or not It'd be all online. All right, they'd be able to do this online. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to your point, when someone comes to visit, it would be in the moment. Let's say I have a visitor at my house. You go ahead and greet them. What's your license plate number? On your phone or call it in. Mm -hmm. And it's done. done. And as soon as you hit submit, that permit is active. So it's really a moot point. Perfect. It's that smart. I mean, it's, it's, it's instantaneous. Perfect. Uh, again, for right now, until we have these larger conversations, I am comfortable with zero. <clears throat> whatever buckets the system has, and then we can have a collaborative conversation. We can, I think we need to include the businesses, some of their can, feedback. Can people call in or it has to be online? No, if someone would call in, we would log in mm -hmm. okay. and do it. So it's okay. all. So that would be an online. option for people. Is it an app or do you have to go on the Narvith Bar? Unless webpage? it's a weekend. It'll be the web page, right. and there'll be a link, or at night. and it's all through the but same way. It's process process it looks similar. So we could keep it at that as is until we have these bigger conversations. Sure. And then easily have a resolution once we figure some of this stuff out. Okay, and can we just go over the hours of, the, of enforcement for it's just the, it's the current. What are they currently? Yeah, what are the current uh, hours? We're not changing any time. Nine to six? Is it nine to five or nine to six? Eight to six Monday through Saturday. Eight to six Monday through Saturday. Yep. No, that's in the change. two hour zone though. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, right. We should we should probably end here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're prepared to speak for us as a committee yeah. that recommendation, <laughs> right? That we're keeping it. Let me be clear with this. Our recommendation is that we keep the hours as is, and that we keep the current visitor fee at zero mm -hmm. until we can have all. What? Well, there's buckets a day, a week, a month, or do you decide the buckets, Matt? Or meaning? Oh, what? I don't have to decide. I don't want to decide. The council has to. I mean the program. Okay, so yeah. then we define the buttons. But the, the thing is, right now it's all zero until we can have a discussion. And the hours are as stands eight to six. Monday through Saturday. Monday through Saturday. You can call in the or two, go hours in. two hours only. And zero fee. With the understanding that we're going to have a comprehensive approach. And to the and the residential invitee permit will last. Well, well, that's the buckets, right? What well, time frame? I'm not saying that like, he does not want to be put in a position. I know. What do we that? say? You can call it in for one day or one week? Is that working? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, there. You just need to give me the calls. Zero. Not and our recommendation is zero. Okay. And, and, and it emphasizes the temporary recommendation is a temporary solution that would be revisited. And a process. And do you want a, would you consider a, very, you know, like a validation step where if I'm a resident who is asking for a permit for a visitor to send in verification that they are a resident of that block, because we can do that too. Yeah. Have them take a picture of their license plate registration that shows, oh yeah, yep, you do. That feels strange. Okay. It would just be a way to fight the problem a bit. The dice in the problem. Right. I'm gonna go with if you gain the system, karma will get you at some yeah, point, right? Temporary. Yeah. You know, we can. So you see how it's working. Tweak yeah. it. Well, that way you won't have to review anything in the office. Yeah. Just be yeah. processed. So, and if there is right, a bit of abuse, then we can come back and right. If there's evidence, right. the system's being abused, we can just call the numbers. Perfect. Okay. All right. Adjourned.